The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you indeed bring big things in little packages. And our souls are joined with the Blessed Virgin Mother. And we magnify your great love and care and compassion for all that you have made. As we enter into this week, O oh Lord, let us sing your praise. Let us magnify your name for your goodness. Let us know that we are called like your Son to minister to those who around us are in need of your loving care. Help us to be attentive to the sick and the poor and the needy and the marginalized, for that is indeed what you showed us when you came in such humble means. Now as we hear your word and share in your gospel, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, who is our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Yeah, thank you. You, you kind of put an image in my head as you as you did the the uh, the yeah yeah <laughs> exactly. I do that all the time. That the image that you gave us in the children's homily today. You know, of course, you know it's taken uh, uh, George. God bless George La Charity. It's taken him a little bit. You know, day after day, he kind of goes after that tree every little bit. But you know, you know, you know where, where where oak trees come from, right? I mean, it's fitting. It's an oak tree, right? They kind of come from acorns. So the image I get in my head is the is the one I, I took Sarah a couple of weeks ago to see the new Peanuts movie, right? And they have a short at the beginning of the movie, and it's one of those Ice Age shorts, you know, the one with the little prehistoric squirrel at the beginning, and you know what he's chasing, right? He's chasing the acorn. That's exactly right. You know, and in many ways, I think that's kind of a, a metaphor for us in Advent. We're chasing the acorn. We're chasing the acorn. We're on an Advent journey, knowing that that little acorn becomes a, a great, big, giant tree that shades us from the heat of the sun. In fact... The sun is upon, among us and upon us. You know, it is the, the fourth Sunday of Advent. 
Just a few days away is Christmas. You know, as teachers, we can appreciate the fact that, you know, last week was a little bit crazy, right? I call it the Christmas crazy. That's exactly what it is. Because the kids are crawling the walls. I mean, we all can feel the anticipation of Christmas coming. The lights are lit. The, all the, you know, the people that decorate, the ones that, you know, that do the whole Christmas vacation nutso in their front lawn. I'm one of them, so I'm just going to say that. Okay? The anticipation. You, you could cut it with a knife. But before we launch into the angels and the shepherds and the opening of packages and, and family coming from here, there, and yonder, let us stop for a moment, I think, and ponder the journey that in some ways continues on. It's the last Sunday of Advent. But we, we want to stop and, and think about how it is that we got there. I mean, sometimes I think that's a, a prime mistake we often make is that, that we so focus on the, the destination that we forget the wisdom that is gained on the journey. And we are journeying still. But today we are journeying with someone that at least as Protestants, as Lutherans, we, we don't quite know what to think about the Blessed Virgin. Now, of course, as, as Lutherans, we understand she's not the center of our devotion. Nonetheless, today's text brings us Mary and her example. Brings us Elizabeth as well. Two women. And I think that's kind of extraordinary. There's a blessing in the fact that we have four Gospels, right? None of them tell the story of Jesus and his life and his ministry the exact same way. I mean, even the ones that are very similar. And there are three, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the, the synoptic gospels because they are very similar, but they're not the same. And the birth narratives are one of those areas in which we see the greatest diversity. You've got uh, Mark who speaks nothing at all of the birth narrative. He just starts right off with Jesus' baptism, and the, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. Doesn't even talk about his birth. Something incredible, something miraculous to begin with. And, and we'll get into that in, in just a moment as well. Because there's a miracle there going on in the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And, and, and you go from Mark to, to John who speaks in very spiritual, ethereal terms, right? And it doesn't really kind of dwell on the idea, the story of angels and, and, and mothers and fathers and, and births and stables. He says simply, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And that Word came and dwelt among us. So John tells a very different story. Matthew, Matthew likes to focus on genealogies. I mean, that's why the kids so love opening up Matthew. Because you got, you know, about 19 names nobody can pronounce. But the point of Matthew's gospel, of course, is that through Joseph, Jesus is part of the, 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 the prophecy. The messianic prophecies from of old that promised that the Messiah would be born from the line of David to which Joseph was a part. It's why Mary and Joseph had to go to that little bitty town, the city of bread. I mean, it's kind of interesting if you stop and think about Bethlehem today. It, it, it's, it's so small that it's kind of gotten subsumed into Jerusalem, as, as Jerusalem has grown as a city. Now Bethlehem's just kind of a neighborhood of the town. Now, the, the wall that the, that the Israeli government's kind of putting a damper on that, but it's a different story. Reality is that Bethlehem is kind of surrounded by Jerusalem in many ways. It is a, a little town. Luke's gospel is different. Luke tells an entirely different tale from a different perspective. One that is uh, a little unusual for the, for the context of first century in Palestine. He's focusing on the women. Not really just the women either. Luke's 
In fact, as we enter in, by the way, I don't know if you realize this, but with the beginning of Advent, after Christ the King Sunday, we enter into the third year in the three-year cycle of lessons. There are three years, year A, year B, and year C. Uh, a is uh, is Matthew, B is Mark, we just got done with Mark, and now we're in Luke. And John's gospel is kind of peppered in throughout uh, throughout the, the, uh, the three years. But I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the lessons throughout the year, that one of the major themes of Luke's gospel is Jesus' attentiveness to the poor, to the oppressed, to the marginalized, to the weak. And that begins from the very beginning of this gospel, it begins with the woman to whom the angel Gabriel will come in the first place, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now again, like I said, you know, we, we as Lutherans, as Protestants, we, we struggle with our understanding. We don't want to get too close to the idea that, 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 that Mary is, is a mediator of our salvation. However, I think it is important to, to fully grasp what and who Mary really is from the pages of Scripture. I had a, I remember back to a conversation, I first, one of the first conversations I ever had. It was at Christmas, interestingly enough, with my father-in-law. My wife and I hadn't been married very long. And my father-in-law, bless him, is a, a virulent, shall we say, Protestant. And I don't know why this question came up, because we were watching the movie Luther, of all things. But he turned to me in the middle of the movie... And he, because I think he was trying to understand Lutheranism more, you know, probably, probably doing a little bit of the background thing of trying to understand this knucklehead that was marrying his daughter. That's a different story. So he turned to me and he said, "Why is it that Catholics call Mary the Mother of God?" And I thought, "Cause she is." <laughs> and anybody who doesn't think so is a heretic. I mean, how many times do you get to call your father-in-law a heretic? I mean. <laughs> But the reality is that while she isn't the center of our devotion, she is still to us what the Greeks would call from the very beginning. And this is one of the, the real early doctrines of the church. Theotokos. In Greek that means God bearer. Because in her womb is salvation herself. And we see the beginnings of the, the telling of this story in our text for today. But you see, Mary's song is a story of praise and thanksgiving. It is a story. It is a song of faith. Let it be to me according to God's word. And she goes and she visits Elizabeth. That's a wonderful story. Two women, marginalized group nonetheless. I mean, let's face it. Women weren't the rich. They weren't the powerful. They weren't the elite. They weren't the decision makers, even back then. They didn't have grocery stores. That didn't work like that. So even in those kind of deals, they didn't have decisions to make in that regard. Women were marginalized in society, especially young women and old women. I mean, it, think about the, 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 the contrasts in our story here. You've got Mary, who's a young teenager. And Elizabeth, let's just say she was a little experienced. But nonetheless, Elizabeth is with child. The one who would announce the birth of the, of the, the Savior who would be born through Mary. And the Spirit is at work and alive in the midst of this interaction. I don't know if you realize this, but how many people have ever heard of the... Those of you that are, 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 have kind of a Roman Catholic background will know where this comes from, what this is. I mean, a lot of people are, are, are familiar with the rosary, right? Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. I'll be honest with you, I have no problem with those words. You know why? Because we just heard them in Scripture a minute ago, didn't we? That's the truth. And what is it that makes... Her blessed, because Mary said yes. What a statement of faith. What an idea that because of this act of God, her whole life has been subsumed in the story of God's salvation. And she said yes. And then she begins to sing. 
a song of gratefulness, a song of joy. And she magnifies the Lord. Man, she's on fire. She's absolutely on fire in our text for today. Now, I want you to understand, as we get done with the, the, the message for this morning, we will sing this song. We will join with Mary because, really, this song is not just Mary's song. It's ours as well. And she magnifies the Lord. Now, I, I, wanna, I also want to make this perfectly clear. The, the connection between our Old Testament lesson for today and, and our new, our gospel, is clear. If you go back to, to Micah's reading, where, uh, where Pastor was kind of bringing his, uh, his children's homily to us from. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for, for, for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. I think it's important to point out that Mary's song really isn't Mary's song. She's borrowing something here. It goes back to a, one of the, early, the oldest books in the Old Testament. The book of 1 Samuel. Because you see, Mary's song is not just Mary's song. It's Hannah's song. Anybody know who Hannah is? This is going way back here. Hannah is the mother of the prophet Samuel. She is married to a man named Elkanah, and, and he has another wife too. Her name is Penina. Penina is uh, uh, apparently, at least in Penina's own mind, a good wife. Because why? She can do exactly what the the, the, first, the first commandment of God do, does. She is fruitful and multiplies many, many times. So she gives, gives Elkanah many children. But Hannah, bless her heart, she's a barren one. And this is distri- disturbing to her to a great extent. So she goes and she prays in the temple night after night after night, bringing gifts and offering her prayers to God. And her prayers are answered. And she gives birth to a son and calls him Samuel. And Samuel will be the one who will be the messenger of God that will go and select the forefather of our Savior, King David. Who was, of course, from small beginnings to begin with, the small shepherd boy who can take out great giants with little rocks. Talk about little things from, big things from little beginnings. Indeed. And so Hannah is so thankful, she breaks into a song. Her own song. I want you to see how similar this is to Mary's. Starts off like this. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. Now, the word that's in the Greek that is translated for us in Mary magnifies is the same exact word if you go back to the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament in Greek. It's the exact same word, exalts. My heart exalts in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. And those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. But those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. It goes on to say, He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. And finally, the last verse of Hannah's song, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Brother and sister, Hannah's song is Mary's song. It is the church's song. We know that those words are true. For God has come not to the hum, not to the proud, not to the wealthy, not to the well-heeled. But God has come 
to save those who are humble in His presence. And this is important. We see that continually throughout Luke. I mean, think about when Jesus begins His very own ministry. In Luke chapter 4, He gets up at, in Nazareth and He goes to the synagogue and He begins to read from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 61. And this is what Jesus says at the beginning of His own ministry. The fully adult, fully grown Jesus begins His ministry with these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good news to who? To the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. You see, the truth is that Jesus didn't come to the rich and powerful, to those who even thought like perhaps the Pharisees that their own righteousness exceeded everything else. No, indeed, that's not the message. And we see that even further when Jesus in chapter 18 of Luke tells them one of His parables. That's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I think that kind of identifies the real message for us in Mary's song. The beauty of this young girl is her humility. And she invites us to share in that humility. For it is to the humble that Christ comes. That's any of us who perhaps don't need a Savior. What is it that Jesus says in the parable? Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, the unjust, the adulterers, even that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But that tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea magna culpa. I am guilty, O Lord. I am greatly guilty. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. I'll, wrap, I'll conclude with this. I was watching movies this week, and I came across an old, uh, well, it's not really old, uh, Clint Eastwood movie. Now, I'm quite convinced Clint Eastwood is a closet Lutheran theologian. Just saying. Isn't he? Isn't he? The movie was Unforgiven. If you've ever seen that movie, it is really a classic. It causes us to stop and think. The, the story behind it is that Clint Eastwood plays a man by the name of William Money. And Money, is, in his younger days, was intemperate and, and well, just a killer. A cold-blooded killer. But he, he got married, and his, his sainted wife shows him the error of his ways. He leaves all that behind, has children, but his wife dies, and, and, and life is not so good for William anymore. A young man who, remember, who who had a relative that remembered money from his evil days comes to him because there's a story that a woman, a woman of the night, shall we say, has been assaulted by two cowboys, and he needs to be punished. He deserves what he's going to get. And there's actually a bounty out there for his life. So he and uh, um, the other... I can't remember the actor right now. I can't remember. Goodness gracious. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Thank you. That's it. Morgan Freeman and the boy and Clint Eastwood go to find these two banditos. And, and they do exactly what the, 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 uh, the bounty does. A thousand dollars, you're going to split it three ways. And after they've done the deed, they're kind of waiting outside the, the, the town to, for the other friend to come back. He won't because he's been caught and executed. But they're sitting there reflecting on, because the, the young boy who, who actually commits the last of the two murders, <laughs> of all places, committing it while the guy's in the outhouse. But he's reflecting on this being the first. I mean, he, he likes to pretend he's, he's a hard young man, but he's really not. 
And he stops to think about the, the murder he's just committed. And he's trying to justify it in his mind by saying, well, I guess he had it coming. And Clint Eastwood's response to that was, forget about it, boy, we've all got it coming. It's the truth. We've all got it coming. But the good news is that it's to those who recognize that, that the child has come. God's mercy and forgiveness and compassion is limitless for those who recognize their sin. See, that's the benefit of this, of this st- message. And not only is it a statement of faith and a song of praise, it's a call to repentance that reminds us that we too are sinners in need of a Savior. Mary's song is our song. We recognize what it is that God has done, is doing, and continues to do. His promise is true. His word is fulfilled. Let us all magnify the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.